welcome to our class. Today we're going to be talking about the NFIB versus the Sibelius case, which is also, as you may be more familiar with, the Medicaid case. So basically, the fact of this case is that on March 2010, President Obama signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, henceforth the AACA into law. So shortly after Congress passed the ACA, the constitutionality of two of its measures were challenged. Measure one included the individual mandate, which would encompass, well, it would require most Americans to maintain a minimum essential health insurance coverage. And that would mean that from 2014 onwards, those citizens that did not comply with the mandate must take a shared responsibility payment to the federal government. Furthermore, this penalty is paid to the Internal Revenue Services or the IRS and shall be assessed and collected in the same manner as tax penalties or so it reads. And then measure two would be about the Medicaid expansion. This would be the, well, before the previous Medicaid program offered federal funding to states to assist pregnant women, children, needy families, the blind, the elderly, and also the disabled in obtaining, obtaining medical care. However, the ACA expanded the number of individuals the states would have to cover by including all adults. This would mean with or without children and that had an income of up to 133% of the federal poverty level. So if a state did not comply with the new coverage, that the requirements of the new coverage, it could lose all federal Medicaid funds. So not only those destined to the new coverage. In that case, the parties would be, the plaintiffs would be the NFIB or the National Federation of Independent Businesses, 26 states and several individuals, the, the defendants or the Secretary of Health Human Services, the Civilius, AKA the US government. So here we're gonna tackle two main legal issues which concern the Supreme Court. For once, it would be whether the court has competence to review the validity of the individual mandate. And on the other hand, whether or not the Congress had the power under the constitution to enact the challenge provisions. So keep in mind the underlying question for both of these issues that you need to retain would be whether or not the individual mandate would qualify as a tax or a penalty. The particularity of this case is that for the same mandatory contribution, this shared responsibility payment, the Supreme Court qualifies it as two different things depending on what piece of legislation it's applying. In the first stage of analysis, which is answering the question whether the Supreme Court is competent to revise the validity of uh, this measure, they are referring to a specific act uh, of the US, which goes back to what we read in session three. Uh, an important matter in litigation is whether or not a tax has to be paid before uh, going to court or after going to court. In most OECD countries, they don't require you to pay this tax before, but in the US, there's the Anti-Injunction Act, which establishes that no suit for the purpose of restraining assessment of collection of any tax shall be maintained in any court by any person. Essentially, what this means is that courts cannot restrain the collection of the tax. So as an individual, you have to first pay your tax and only then you can go to court and ask for a refund if you consider that the assessment or the collection was not appropriate, right? So for this Anti-Injunction Act to apply, we would need to consider that the mandatory payment is a tax in this case, but under the law, they called it a penalty, right? The amicus curiae, which is known for friend of the court, basically an advisor to the Supreme Court, says that even if in the legal provision it's called a penalty, in practice, it works like tax, and so the Anti-Injunction Act should apply, and Supreme Court shouldn't be able to evaluate a tax which has not been collected yet, because it would be enforceable in 2014, and the suit is from 2012, right? But Chief Justice Roberts says that since the Anti-Injunction Act and the Affordable Care Act are two pieces of legislation which come from Congress, how they relate to each other is going to depend on what Congress wants. And there's no clearer expression of Congress's intention than the statutory text. So they're only going to look at the letter of the law. If Congress wanted to call it a penalty and used a different word, that is because they wanted to distinguish it from other clauses which are taxes and for which the Anti-Injunction Act will apply. The amicus curiae responds that 
if we look at the letter of the law, the government also said that it shall be assessed and collected in the same manner as an assessable penalty. And under the Internal Revenue Code, an assessable penalty under certain circumstances is considered a tax. And so they claim once again that this should be a tax and that the Supreme Court should not be able to evaluate whether it should be collected or not. But Chief Justice Roberts answers that this indication that it shall be assessed and collected in the same manner as assessable penalties just refers to the methodology of the way uh, that the Secretary of the Treasury shall collect these penalties. But it does not equate both terms. In fact, if you look at other provisions of the Internal Revenue Code, you can see that these terms are distinguished. For instance, there's a provision where they say that some assessable penalties will be considered tax, which means that other assessable penalties are not a tax and that not all assessable penalties are taxes. In conclusion, the Supreme Court says that since Congress did not make the Anti-Injunction Act apply and they choose a different language, in this case, it will not apply and they are competent to analyze the merits of the case. As we saw in class, the federal government has a limited number of enumerated powers in the Constitution. So in order to conclude whether or not this measure is constitutional, we would have to determine which clause of the Constitution gives government this power. Um, briefly, since this is not the main focus of the case, the Supreme Court concludes that they do not have power under the commercial clause because in this case, there's no economic activity. There's an absence of economic activity, not purchasing medical insurance. And so Congress would be compelling commerce, not regulating it. And that it cannot be uh, empowered either under the necessary and proper clause, because this would extend the go uh, government's power beyond what is considered proper. So since Congress couldn't have uh, used the two previous clauses as a justification, the court turned to analyze whether Congress would have competence under the taxing clause under Article 1, which enables Congress to lay and collect taxes. In order for this clause to apply, the individual mandate would have to qualify as a tax. And while the penalty label was fatal for the application of the Anti-Injunction Act, in the second stage of analysis, what matters most is not what the letter of law says, but rather how the mandatory contribution works in practice. So the court adopted a broader interpretation of what taxing looks like in practice. In the 1895 case, Hooper v. California, the court actually stated that every reasonable construction must be resorted to in order to save a statute from unconstitutionality. And similarly, in this case, it was stated that if a statute has two possible meanings, one of which violates the constitution and one which does not, courts should adopt the meaning that does not do so. So here the question became uh, not which is the most natural interpretation of the mandate, but instead whether it, was, it is fairly possible to consider that it was a tax. So what did the court conclude? Firstly, the court had to ask the question, is it a penalty? And they define a penalty as a punishment for an unlawful act or omission. And if we were to consider the shared responsibility payment as a penalty, this would mean that the failure to purchase health insurance would be considered unlawful. So we go to the question, is it unlawful? And the government estimated that 4 million people each year would choose to pay the IRS tax rather than buy insurance. So if Congress really considered the failure to buy health insurance as unlawful, it would not seem reasonable to assume that they would regard such an extensive failure to comply as tolerable. So these 4 million are clearly not outlaws, but rather they made the legitimate choice of paying the IRS tax over buying health insurance. And this led to the court to consider the question um, of how to interpret the individual mandate. And they stated that it was like establishing a condition which would be not owning health insurance, which would then trigger a tax. So the requirement to pay the IRS. And they revealed that the amount of the tax is not as high as it would, uh, so it leaves people with the choice to buy insurance or get taxed. And in this way, um, they found, they concluded that the mandate is not a legal command to buy insurance. Rather, it makes going without insurance just another thing that the government is in the power to tax. And of course, the court here doesn't deny that the payment is intended to affect individual conduct. And clearly, Congress is trying to get people to buy medical insurance with this measure. But as we've seen in class, and as the court states in its analysis, it is valid for taxes to have a regulatory function. 
And the US Constitution doesn't guarantee that individuals may avoid taxation through inactivity. So this begs the question, what type of tax is it then? So this is relevant to determine whether apportionment or the idea that each state pays in proportion to the population according to Article 9, Clause 4, um, is necessary in this case or not. So as it is highlighted in the slide, you can see that the court concluded that a tax on going without health insurance does not fall within any recognized category of direct tax. So this would mean that, it, as a matter of fact, it is not a capitation. So it does not require an apportionment, and it is also plainly not a tax on the ownership of land or personal property. So the whole point of the share responsibility payment is that it is triggered by specific circumstances, earning a certain amount of income, but not obtaining health insurance. So going into the Medicaid expansion, this would be that the court also explains that the Medicaid expansion was expansion, sorry, was not valid in behalf of uh, the exercise of the power of Congress. Why? As you can see there in the case of New York versus the US, the Constitution simply does not give Congress the authority to require states to regulate. So it depends on the states. Sorry, it depends on, on the states for them to voluntarily and knowingly accepting the terms of such programs that they are being a part of. Furthermore, we can see the unconstitutionality of it all because by threatening to take away all Medicaid funds, which represent the 10% 10 10 of states' overall budget, if states do not comply with the expansion, Congress exceeded its power, leaving states with no real option or possibility to, cho to choose whether or not to accept the program that they're being involved in. So this would mean that there is a threat when withdrawing the funds to be deemed unconstitutional. The remedy to all of this would be uh, to exclude the application, leaving other provisions of the AC ACA completely intact. So in conclusion, what you have to retain from this case is how important it is to qualify a certain mandatory contribution as a tax or as something else. And the Supreme Court was very smart in this case because when they were analyzing it under one piece of legislation that would eventually would have prevented them from judging the case, they claim that they're only going to look at the literal interpretation. So what does the Congress say that this is a penalty? And then when they're actually looking at the Congress powers to enact these measures, they concluded that in practice, it works like a tax. So with this play with interpretation, they managed to save Obamacare and it is still working now for some of the citizens of the US. So it's very important how we classify these mandatory contributions. And lastly, it also gives a bit of insight on the dynamics between the federal government and state governments, where you can see that state cannot impose, um, the, the federal government cannot impose uh, regulations on states, but sometimes requires uh, their consent and legitimacy uh, to pass these sort of spending programs. Thank you for your attention.